Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural event of the 2020 to 2021 History and Theory of New Media Lecture Series, organized and presented by the Berkeley Center for New Media, or BCNM. The theme of this year's lecture series is Indigenous Technologies, and we are so grateful and honored that Karina Gold of the, of the Sagarate Land Trust is joining us as our first speaker tonight. And also that Marcelo Garzo Montalvo is with us as tonight's moderator. I also wanna thank Lara Wolf and Sophia Hussein, BCNM's amazing staff members for all of their phenomenal work to make this and all BCNM events happen. Just so you know, we're leaving the chat open for everyone's participation, as long as all the comments stay respectful. And as you think of questions for Karina and Marcelo, please post those in the Q&A box in Zoom. The Berkeley Center for New Media is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chechenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the confederated villages of Lashan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land, and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationship with tribal leaders and organizations. I proposed making indigenous technologies a theme of this year's lecture series because, as we can see, settler colonialism and global hypercapitalism and their oppressive modalities have led to wide-scale disasters, including failed public health structures, radical inequality, systemic racial violence, and climate calamities, such as our rampant wildfires, record heat, and rising waters in California. Now, more than ever, we need to collectively, with humility and openness, receive a thorough education in indigenous knowledges as a foundational step towards healing our environment and transforming our society. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Marcelo Garzo Montalvo. Marcelo is a musician, danzante or ceremonial dancer, and ethnic studies scholar activist. They are a visiting assistant professor of Latinx studies at Harvard University and the coordinator of indigenous technologies at BCNM. They are also one of the most amazing, brilliant, intelligent, creative, generous, insightful, and super fun people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And I'm so thankful they're here leading this event. Marcelo, please take it away. Well, thanks for that, Gail. Mari Mari, Compuche, Upeñi, Pulamien, Che Marcelo Piñen. My name is Marcelo Garza Montalvo. I'm really uh, grateful and happy to be here. Um, I'm really grateful for another day of life um, here to have this conversation, uh, to be present uh, as a community here in, in cyberspace, um, here to have you know, this really important, relevant conversation um, amidst uh, climate chaos, uh, amidst what's happening for us here, um, here in Huchin, in Ohlone territory. I wanna give thanks uh, to this place uh, to um, the ancestors of this land, uh, to my Ohlone relatives, to my Lishan Moekma relatives for allowing me to be here as a guest. And um, just very grateful um, that we get to have this space together. Um, I'm also very excited that this is our first uh, opportunity to have um, a conversation within this program and this focus uh, this focused intention on indigenous technologies. So the, um, I'm really grateful for the Berkeley Center for New Media uh, for initiating this, um, for asking me to help coordinate this program for the year. And of course, to Karina um, for joining us today to help us um, start this conversation. Um, part of that context, our intent is, is to make sure that uh, this be the beginning of a, of a formal relationship between the BCNM and um, Segurite Land Trust. And we're really grateful for that relationship, for that friendship. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to share um, that's happening in that way is that BCNM uh, has committed 
to our Shumi land tax, to paying our voluntary land tax to the Segorite Land Trust. Um, we also wanted to, to share that um, because it's something that we are want to uh, model and encourage all of our colleagues in any place on campus or any institution, any place where you're at, whether you're on Ohlone land or not, but especially for those of us who are here, who are not native to this place uh, and who have budgets that we have some sort of decision-making over, we really encourage you to go to the Segorite Land Trust website at segoritelandtrust.org and they have information there and a calculator to help you figure out what a uh, respectful and a relevant um, Shumi land tax looks like for us to directly support their work. Um, of course, there's all these other ways that we could do that, but we really think it's important for us uh, at UC Berkeley to be doing that work um, and to, to uh, directly, concretely support our Ohlone relatives in that way. Um, beyond that, I'm very excited to just share about um, this program around indigenous technologies, this conversation. Um, is something that is uh, incredibly relevant to these times um, in, in a way that we want to really um, center indigenous voices and we really want to um, center indigenous ways of knowing uh, as ways that we can be in conversation about being good relatives, being good human beings uh, today to each other, to the land and to be in right relationship. And so I just want to say that that is really the intention and the heart of this work is that we uh, uh, remember who we are and we remember our purpose on this planet and in this time to be good relatives to each other and to this place and to the, the lands on which we live and to the water and to the elements. Um, so Indigenous Technologies is a program uh, of the Berkeley Center for New Media that engages questions of technology and new media in relation to global structures of indigeneity, settler colonialism, and in resistance to colonialism and genocide in the 21st century. Um, our indigenous technology events and ongoing conversations with indigenous scholars and communities aim to critically envision and reimagine what a more just and sustainable technological future can look like. Um, we will highlight indigenous engagements with robotics, computer science, telecommunications, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, social media, online activism, video games, and more. This programming is grounded in the ethic that indigenous worldviews and approaches to technology offer important and innovative ways of addressing the most urgent and interconnected crises of our times, including climate change, climate chaos, which is related to viral pandemics, and also in, uh, at large, the viability of human futurity itself, of our species. Uh, indigenous technologies are not outdated or otherwise marginal to these debates. Instead, we ask that we shift the dominant narrative and that we recenter indigenous voices as solutionaries in this conversation. Uh, despite predominant cultural narratives of apocalypse and end of times, we seek to maintain an orientation towards the possibility of a sustainable and creative indigenous-led future. We're rooted in commitments to epistemic plurality, which is a fancy way of saying many ways of knowing, honoring many ways of understanding, and interculturality, which is relationships amongst communities, what the Zapatistas have called a world in which there is room for many worlds. We seek to create a space of dialogue, of learning and unlearning and of interconnection. In this place, I also want to give thanks to Gail for this vision and for understanding that she really introduced me into this uh, discursive political and, and just shift of saying, actually, there is apocalypse as a, as, a, as a narrative, but there also is collapse. And that in that space, collapse is collapse of a particular type of civilization. It's a collapse of a particular way of relating. And that is what we're living in right now, this time of collapse. But what we really want to start this conversation with Karina and with Sogorate is that in that space of collapse, there have been people and there are folks, there are communities, there are organizations, there are folks who have been working for when that collapse inevitably was going to come. 
these systems have never been sustainable. And so people have been working to build systems that are alternative and viable for when this collapse inevitably happens. And that's really what we're trying to focus on in terms of indigenous futurity and indigenous technologies as having been built, they've been here, and now is our time to collectively respect them and give them their due time and, and space and resources. Um, so in that way, without further ado, I'm very uh, honored and privileged to introduce um, our guest, um, Karina Gould, as a Lishan Ohlone leader. They are the chair and spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lishan. She was born and raised in Oakland, California, in the village of Huchin. A mother of three and grandmother of four, Karina is the co-founder and lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native-run organization that works on indigenous people's issues and sponsors annual Shell Mound Peace Walks from 2005 to 2009. These walks brought about education and awareness of the desecration of sacred sites in the Greater Bay Area. As a tribal leader, she has continued to fight for the protection of shell mounds, uphold her nation's inherent right to sovereignty, and stand in solidarity with her indigenous relatives to protect our sacred waters, mountains, and lands all over the world. Her life's work has led to the creation of the Segorite Land Trust, a woman-led organization within the urban setting of her ancestral territory of the Bay Area. Segorite Land Trust works to return indigenous lands to indigenous people based on an understanding that Oakland is home to many people that have been oppressed and marginalized. Segorite works to create a thriving community that lives in relation to the land. Through the practices of rematriation, cultural revitalization and land restoration, the land trust calls on native and non-native peoples to heal and transform legacies of colonization, genocide, and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Karina, uh, turn it over to Karina. So thank you very much for being here. Good day, relatives. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen with you all. I'm hoping that everybody's doing well today. And one second. <clears throat> I want to thank Marcelo and Gail and all of the staff members at the Berkeley Center for New Media. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to begin to work um, uh, together in this brand new time. And uh, before I start this presentation, I want to offer us a time for us to just kind of take a deep breath while we can. And, uh, and to bring into, you know, we woke up yesterday morning to an orange sky and it stayed like that very eerily all day long. And I've never done that in my whole life. I've lived here in my home territory. I've never uh, saw a sky like that. And, um, and it made me pause and wonder what it's gonna be like for my grandchildren in the coming years, what it's gonna be like for our children and what it's gonna be like for the next seven generations and how it's time for us to really wake up. The world has given us a time right now to look at all of these lessons. And um, I'm hoping that we at, together can come and figure out how it is that we're supposed to be in right relation like Marcella was talking about. So I'm gonna invite you to take a deep breath with me. And with this deep breath, I want us to uh, bring in that, that fresh air, that if that's fresh air that you can breathe right now, I want you to be thankful for that air and, um, and let us uh, send those good thoughts and good blessings to uh, our brothers and sisters that are having a hard time right now um, getting good air and for our relatives that are four-legged and are uh, winged um, and those that are in the waters that are having difficult time breathing right now because of the fires. So if we could just take a deep breath with me. And let it go. 
we're going to take a deep breath and we're going to uh, be thankful for those things that we have right now to be grateful for uh, for having safety if we have safety and to also send out good uh, good blessings and feelings to all of those that are running right now from the disasters whether it's the fires here or for floods or from the amazing um, hurricanes and the snow that's happening at a time that it shouldn't be happening. And so let's just take a deep breath right now and let it go. I wanna offer you to think about uh, all of the blessings and good things and the ways that you know that you can be a good human being right now, how you can share and open your heart how we can have a, have a chance right now to do better, to ensure that our, we survive um, this time and that we could make the world, help the world to heal right now and that you have the power to do that. And I want you to believe that in your heart, to call in your ancestors from the four directions, to bring, uh, bring them here to be by your side, to hold you up from below and behind you, in front of you, beside you and above you, to remind us that we are resilient and that we have the tools that we need in order to fix the things that are, are wrong right now on our earth. So take a deep breath and believe in yourself. I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to come and be the first person to speak to you at this in, um, important time right now. Uh, I think that it's an amazing thing. This says, welcome to Hu Chin. And I don't know who all is in Hu Chin. Hu Chin is a territory, one of the ter traditional territories of the Lashan Nation. Um, it encompasses six Bay Area cities. And so if you live in Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, or Piedmont, you are in the territory of Huchin. And I like to talk to people about uh, what our territories um, now. So if you can believe that uh, we had places that a long time ago, but my ancestors um, were first living here for thousands and thousands of years. And maybe people had never heard of Ohlone people. And actually, Ohlone is a generic term that we um, took up we were called Costanoan when the settlers first got here. The Spaniards um, came here to the territory and they kind of shoved us all together under this one name. They all lived on the coast, so we're all Costanoans. And during the 50s and 60s, people began to think about a different identity. Who, what is it that they wanted to be called? And so many of the different tribes took on the word Ohlone. And it is a derivative of a village site in the Southern territory of Ohon. But today, as we begin to decolonize our minds and begin to take up our sovereignty and the way we are and to really take our place back in our own territories, we begin to take back our own names. And so as I introduce myself, I say, Horse Tuhi, Ka'at Lashanka, Ka'at Ra'at Karina. My name is Karina Gould and I am Lashan. And that is the name that our ancestors have had since the beginning of time. We see ourselves sometimes in these old um, books, um, and these are the only pictures of our ancestors that we have to go by. And so um, in the history books, and when children are taught about us, it's always in the past. And so for my lifetime, I've been fighting this lie, uh, what I call paper genocide, that we don't exist anymore. We're taught about in fourth grade and then we disappear. And um, it's been a, a fight for the last 25 plus years to really bring us back into the forefront in our own territories. You see, there was actually eight different nations of Ohlone people, and people thought we were all one people, but we actually had eight different languages and eight different creation stories, and we had many villages with, within one language group. And so if you can imagine, there was never one overarching tribal uh, nation. Even within a language group, there was many different tribes. And today, it's the same. There's the Lashan people, there's the Mwekma, there's the Ohlone tribe, Inc., there's the Himarin, and we're all derived from the same areas, but we are different tribal sovereign tribes that have our own memberships. And so uh, we speak Chochenyo, that's the language that I spoke to when I introduced myself. My great grandfather, Jose Guzman, was one of the last speakers of the language. And so we had all of these different territories within our language groups and um, had responsibilities to the lands that we are in. 
the Spanish came over um, and our ancestors always lived in villages along the bay. We weren't sedentary. And so when you think about archeologists today, they always say, oh, there's this village and, and, and they make it seem as if we never traveled anywhere. Um, some years ago, we went to these villages, we walked all the way um, to all the villages that, were, that we could find along the bay. And it was a 300 mile walk from Vallejo down to San Jose and up to San, San Francisco. It took us three walk weeks to walk it. I know that if we could do that, that our ancestors were moving um, just like us today. We move around, we don't stay sedentary in one place. We uh, traveled and saw uh, family members and stuff, but we always lived along the, along the bay where fresh water met the salt water uh, where food was abundant. And can you imagine living along the bay? I'm going to go back one. Um, 200 years ago, if you can imagine every creek that you see in the Bay Area was fresh water. Just 200 years ago, you could drink out of, the, out of every creek in the, in the bay. You know, there was salmon and rainbow trout that came up there. There was an abundance of food. There was no such thing as hungry, hunger. And if you can imagine, not that long ago, there was no concept of homelessness. Today, we see the misery of people living on the streets in a country that is the richest country in the world. And yet we cannot house our own people. We have forgotten and gotten away from being in that creation circle. My ancestors left a very small footprint on the earth. And um, today, as we're looking at climate chaos and disaster, um, we, can, we are always talking about leaving a smaller footprint here, leaving a, a smaller place for uh, a, less things, less things. But my ancestors actually only left a few things. Most of them were our mortars and pestles, a few of the items that we created and our shell mounds. Everything else we had, um, our boats, our homes, um, our baskets that we cooked with, uh, we're all biodegradable. And we're looking at that today and talking about how do we create biodegradable things? Um, and our ancestors, if we go back, we're looking at technology, right? Uh, if we look back at the, um, the way we lived not that long ago, um, many of our ancestors were living closer to the earth and had these technologies in order to survive for thousands and thousands of years. The Spanish missionaries came with Spanish soldiers. So, um, they came with this idea of uh, holding down the land. And what I like to talk to fourth graders about mostly is that if you can imagine how Spain got the land of California, 200 years before the Spanish missions came to California, um, they got it because uh, Cabrillo was coming down the coast of California in uh, 1547, I believe, and saw the fires on the land and noticed that there was land here and claimed the land for Spain and the crown without having any conversations with the tribal people that lived here. What I call calling dibs on um, the last thing. If you know what calling dibs is, that's kind of what they did to the land. There was no coming onto the land and creating war. Um, it was just going, floating by on a ship and deciding that's what you wanted to do. That land was for Spain. 200 years later, the Spanish missionaries came and with them, they brought swords and whips and uh, destruction of kinds that our people for thousands of years had could never conceive of. Um, when the Spanish missions came here, they brought soldiers um, and they brought diseases, uh, much like our ancestors survived the pandemics of uh, smallpox and uh, uh, the measles when uh, European people got to our lands. We are facing another pandemic today. What it tells me today is that my ancestors survived this hundreds of years ago and that we are going to survive this pandemic together again. Um, but what happened was that when they came here also was that our languages were taken away from us. Our freedom to eat the foods we wanted to, our freedoms to pray the way we wanted to. And actually, um, we died a lot of uh, diseases and starvation. The foods that were given to us were, had less nutritional value than the foods that were given to people that were in Auschwitz sometimes. And our people died of heartbreak. Um, if you imagine that um, along the coast of California, there were 21 missions or prisons built on stolen land. 
my ancestors lived in two of their, they built and lived in two of those uh, missions, Mission Dolores in San Francisco, and then Mission San Jose in Fremont. Of the 21 missions, there was a guy named Junipero Serra. And Junipero Serra just received a canonization. He became a saint, someone you were supposed to pray to if you're asking for a miracle. For us as uh, Ohlone people and many California native people, um, this was an affront to us. Our ancestors died building these prisons, what I call the first prison industrial complex of California. Um, they were forced to stay there and uh, for about 99 years before the collapse of the mission system. Um, we had lost our land and our freedom of religion, our languages, um, and most of the way the life ways that we had. And so, as Mal um, as Randall Milliken wrote um, in a book, it's called a, a Time of Little Choice. There was a very there was a time when we had a little little choice, whether to go into these prisons that we were created or to uh, die um, trying to survive without land. So these missions that were created and built by my ancestors still stand. They stand here today as a, uh, as a romantic reminder that Spain came here and they brought all of these good things to the native people, um, but they brought devastation. Uh, and I often wonder why fourth graders are taught this particular history. Is it a history that's spoken about and taught because the United States government doesn't want to remember the atrocities that they created once they took over the land. Mexico stole the land a second time and continued the enslavement of our, uh, the indigenous people here. And um, we don't talk about this much in our history books. We talk about uh, when there was, uh, when the Mexican and American war happened, there was a time where in the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo, there was a line that said that California native people were supposed to get some of their land back. The United States government actually uh, failed to follow that part of the treaty. And um, so the land was stolen a third time and our ancestors uh, went from being slaves on the ranchos to um, mass extermination of our people. My ancestors um, had to hide out in order to survive this third wave of genocide by the American government because by the time America came here and was rushing here for the gold rush, they were not interested in creating treaties with American Indians anymore. It was really about extermination uh, to the fullest. And California spent $1.4 million killing California Indians backed by the federal, go federal government, $5 a head and 25 cents an ear. So our ancestors had to hide. It was a disruption of our families. Our, our children were sold at the uh, market, uh, $100 for a little boy, $200 for a little girl. Um, and it was against the law. Some of the very first uh, laws of California made it illegal to be Indian. There were vagrancy laws and we're hearing that today, vagrancy laws coming up for people that are living on the streets. Our history uh, will repeat itself if we don't pay attention. California native people were forced um, to go into these courts of laws um, by white men and were, could not say anything against a white person. And if someone brought them in on a vagrancy law, the court could give them to, uh, as a slave, to the white person to be on a ranch uh, for 40 years. And so there was slavery in California that's never talked about. California Indian people were slaves on our own land. We were uh, hunted down and then we were captured and enslaved um, three different times really. So I'm gonna just take a deep breath because that's a lot of history and a lot of people aren't told this history when they go to school. They're not told the history of what really happened to California Indians when America took over the lands. And sometimes it brings up a feeling of anger or distrust or uh, even a, a disbelief uh, that this happened. Um, but there are some really good books that are written today. Um, one of the books that I know that Benjamin Madley wrote uh, recently called An American Genocide. And it really takes into account all of the horrific laws and things that happened to California Indians um, that were here. And so I, I 
offer you at least the one book to look up and uh, read the history. But it was our, my responsibility as an Ohlone woman who had children growing up in my own territory to remind people that we're still here, that Ohlone, this was Ohlone land, that we had not gone anywhere, that we had not perished. And even though the federal government refuses to see us as tribes, we still have responsibilities to our own lands. I love this, uh, this quote by Linda Hogan. It says, walking, I am listening to a deeper way. Suddenly all my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of love of thousands. This is really, um, it really tells who, about who I am to remind me that even though I am erased in history books, even though I had to fight uh, schools to, for my children not to do the mission projects, even though we're continuing to fight the curriculums that are in schools and to fight places to say that we are still here, that I know that my ancestors are watching over and helping to guide me in the work that I do. And the work that I do is not something that I do alone. Some of the other work that I've done before, and I work with Janelle Rose, who is a, Shosh a Shoshone, Bannock, and Ute uh, woman who came here um, when she was 18 years old and raised her children here. And our uh, daughters went to school together. Um, but we started doing work around sacred sites, uh, work in the Bay Area, in about 1999 and we talk about technology around that time the internet blew up in the bay area and it caused a wave of gentrification people were being outbid for homes and apartments and it cost massive people to move out of the bay area and there was lots of building that was happening just like today we see all these cranes in the um in the sky, not birds, but these cranes that are building buildings. Um, at that time of mass building, we were finding a lot of our shell mounds being destroyed. And this is a map created by Nils Nelson, who was at Berkeley in uh, 1909. He created this map of the shell mounds in the Bay Area. They are our burial sites, our village sites, our ceremonial places along the waters. And each of these little tiny numbers represents a shell mound that he found. In 1909, he found 425 of those shell mounds. Emeryville, if you guys know where the Bay Street Mall is today, Emeryville was the largest of the 425 shell mounds. It was over three stories high and three and a half football fields in diameter. And because it was a brownfield during the same time that the internet blew up, um, the city of Emeryville was broke, decided to clean the uh, place up and to create a mall on top of it. So today, when you go to that mall on Ohlone Street, uh, Ohlone Way and Shell Mound Street, you'll find this little tiny mall that's supposed to, I mean, little tiny mound that's supposed to depict uh, thousands and thousands of years of my ancestors' burials in this mound up here. We had been protecting sacred sites for many years and started working with Wounded Knee Dale Campo, a Miwok man who grew up in Vallejo, California. And for 12 and a half years, Wounded Knee um, was trying to stop the desecration of two shell mounds along the Carquina Strait in Vallejo, California. And um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, when in 2011, we took that site over and we created a village site for 109 days for four and a half months people from all walks of life came and gathered with us had ceremony there and saved this land from being protect uh, from being destroyed ever again um, we were because we stood our ground there we were able to create the first cultural easement between two federally recognized tribes, a park district, and a city. It's the first time this ever happened in this country that protects the land for the entire time um, that it's here. And so we've been blessed. We continue to go back to Segorite, that's the village site up in Vallejo, and to have ceremony there. And we have ceremony with uh, the Winnemum Wintu, and we try to protect the salmon um, and do work there. We also are doing work to save the West Berkeley shell mound. If you're a student at West, uh, in Berkeley, or if you've been to the Berkeley campus, you'll see this beautiful Strawberry Creek that runs through campus. 
with the redwood trees. My ancestors actually had a village site up there uh, where Faculty Glade is and where the Faculty Clubhouse is. And right along the, uh, that area, and if you go down Strawberry Creek all the way to the bottom, you'll hit the West Berkeley Shell Mound, which is on 4th and University, and what now looks like a parking lot. In, 19, uh, in the 1950s, it was totally taken down. This is only a portion of it. It had been um, starting to get moved around. Our Shell Mounds were desecrated by uh, hunters uh, looking for for Indian bones and artifacts. And um, our shell mound material was used to pave the streets of Berkeley and Emeryville. And so quite literally, when you're walking through the streets of Berkeley or Emeryville, you could be walking on my ancestors. A few years ago, four years ago, the city of Berkeley had the developer come and wanted to create this, this uh, outrageous uh, uh, property development that had um, lots of high-end condominiums and shopping underneath it and um, wanted to destroy the shell mound, what was underneath. As we know that whatever was on top that was taken down, that many, many layers and ancestral remains are still underneath the ground. And one of the other things that we know as indigenous people is when one of our sites is capped off like a parking lot, nothing else is built on top of it, that it was safe for a particular purpose. We came up with an alternative plan. We began to show this around to people in the city and asking them to imagine, not a parking lot anymore, but imagine a place where we would open up Strawberry Creek where it used to run before and we could build the land up and grow oak trees and other things that we'd need there and to have an arbor on top of that land so that we can have our traditional dances and to create a mound that um, actually just sits on top of the land and never digs in that's hollow inside and that we can have a place where we can talk about the past but also the resiliency of our people still being here. Uh, we talk about rematriation a lot and the work of Segorite Land Trust and that's where I'm going to right now and I think that the best um, definition for rematriation that we can find at this time is one by Stephen Newcomb and it says I mean to restore a living culture to its rightful place on Mother Earth or to restore a people to a spiritual way of life in sacred relationship with their ancestral lands without external interference. As a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in spiritual relationship with our lands for thousands of years, and that we have a sacred duty to maintain that relationship for the benefit of our future generations. Segorite Land Trust was created specifically for this because for years we fought to figure out how to get our ancestors returned from institutions like UC Berkeley and other institutions in the Bay Area. UC Berkeley holds still over 9,000 of our ancestral remains. And because we are not federally recognized, they have held them um, in uh, trays in a basement. And we're now working with UC Berkeley and changing that policy and trying to figure out how to get our ancestors returned. But it's taken us a lot of time. And if you can imagine, what would we do if we were able to get our ancestors back? Being a non-federally recognized tribe without a land base, how do you create uh, a cemetery that big? So Janella and I decided that we were going to create the, uh, the first urban indigenous women-led land trust in the country. It's a land trust that um, is trying to get land back into indigenous hands a way for us to have ceremony that not only helps us as Ohlone people and indigenous people that have moved to our lands, but it helps everyone that is now living on our lands. It creates a balance. The thousands and thousands of years of having ceremony on this land has been disrupted. And so we wanna figure out how do we do that? As indigenous people in our own territories, it's our responsibility to take care of our guests but we can't be good hosts if we don't have good guests. 
when I ask nine and 10 year olds, what is a good guest? How do you behave yourself when you go to your best friend's house? And uh, they always have the good answers. They say, well, you say thank you and please, you don't touch things that's not yours, you don't break things, you, you ask permission. And, and I said, wow, you know, our, as mothers and fathers, uncles and aunties and grandparents and uh, godparents, we, we teach our children and our grandchildren, nieces and nephews, these good manners. But as adults, we forget that we are living in someone else's home. And we forget that we have a responsibility to be a good guest on those lands. And so Sigourte Land Trust actually offers an opportunity for everyone that lives in this territory to actually be a good guest. A few years ago, we received the first quarter acre of territory, a quarter acre of land in our territory. Imagine for 200, almost 250 years, we have been homeless in our own homelands. Our children and our grandchildren many times cannot live in our own territories because of the, fi uh, the financial burden that's in our territories right now. This piece of land, this quarter acre of land was given back to us by uh, a good couple that run Planting Justice in East Oakland. Uh, almost at the end of 105th Avenue at a dead end street um, is their uh, nursery their organic nursery. And they met with us in the back of their nursery and talked to Janelle and I and asked us if we would take this land back. And the reason was, was because they had gone to Standing Rock. And when they got, went to Standing Rock, they were so moved by what had gone on there that they wanted to know what they should do when they came home. And they asked the elders there what they should do. And the elders told them that they should work with the First Nation people on whose land they're on. And so they took it to heart. An Athabascan elder works for them, uh, Diane Williams, and she had been, and she told them that he sh he, they should meet with us. And so it took us a few months to get there. And then when we did, they offered to give us to give it, rematriate this land back to us. And Janelle LaRose and I um, looked at each other and, and said yes. Um, I think that's one of the ancestors has taught us to do is to say yes when things come because it's them lining things up. The amazing thing is, is that we have people from all walks of life that have come and helped us to build this land back up, to clean it up, to build hoogles, to, to um, take out the weeds and to create a vision um, for people to come back to. Janella had this dream. She's like, we have this quarter acre of land. What are we going to do? And the first thing, of course, was to bring ceremony back. And so we decided that we were going to create an arbor, which is an outdoor uh, open uh, structure that our people dance in and meet in and um, have ceremony in. Uh, but we didn't know how we were supposed to do that. We needed redwood trees and we needed a lot of them. As you can see, this is a, this is a model. Um, is pretty to scale. And so we needed that many redwood trees. And so we put a call out to the community and asked them if anybody had redwood trees or knew anybody that had old telephone poles or, and we got a call from someone, they emailed us and said that they had some open land up in Sonoma County that needed to be thinned out and we could do that. And so we went up and we got those logs to create an arbor and uh, 10 of us went up there. We had one young man who was an African American young man who worked at Planning Justice, who had been in prison and uh, worked on the fire lines and knew how to talk to the trees. And he went up and he helped us. And we had our elders that came up and we put down a prayer for each of these trees and asked them to give us their lives so that we can build an arbor, arbor to bring the people back. And so we were so unconscious of how much work this was going to be. We thought each of these logs uh, full of water weighed about 700 pounds and we moved them uh, down on U-Haul trucks to Oakland thinking that oh, in a month we would have it put up but the logs had lessons for us to learn. And um, it took us a year to skin them and to move them and to sand them and to get them ready to go into the ground. And people came from all over to help us to do this work. Um, 
And this is our young, uh, uh, young assistant, Viola, who came over when she was at Mills College to help us to do that work. Um, this land is here. This is the quarter acre that we received um, where people are standing. And you'll see this creek that's culverted there. And that creek is LaShawn Creek, who my ancestors are named after. You see the freeway overhead and that is all on fill. That's where the bay used to come up to. And my ancestors used to live along the bay where the fresh water met the salt water. So quite literally, this little piece of land, which is a quarter mile walk from my home, is probably a village site or very close to a village site where my ancestors had lived for thousands of years. So I don't take anything for granted. These ancestors have a whole plan ahead for us. This is the first arbor to be built in 250 years, a place that was supposed to get danced in this summer, uh, this past spring. We had started sage plants, white sage plants and tobacco plants by seed that we had grown um, in order to give them away as a uh, giveaway, as a gift when people came in to the arbor for the first time. And then COVID came and we were unable to do that. So we're still working on trying to bring people to dance this in in a traditional way and to uh, bring the community together to celebrate this uh, great work that's happened here. We've created a place called Hamekka, and Hamekka in our language means uh, a place where we gather together as one. Um, and Hamekka is a place where we are going to create, this, we've created this resiliency uh, what people are calling resiliency hub. Janella hates the, that term. And so it's a place where we can gather together in times of, um, of great chaos or trouble. Uh, we learn because when this, where Hemeka is, where the Lashawn Arbor is, is a place that's very, is in Sobrani Park. I live in Sobrani Park. It's a very uh, uh, poor neighborhood. And uh, we know from examples of Katrina and other natural and man-made disasters that poor neighborhoods are the last places to be helped um, when things happen. And so knowing that and our responsibilities to take care of our guests and our, our relations, we begin to work on creating Hameka. Hameka will have uh, uh, fresh water and rainwater, uh, solar panels and uh, food and first aid. And we named this first place after Jacqueline. And Jacqueline was the Guatemalan young woman, or the, she wasn't a young woman. She was like 12 or 13 years old and she passed away. She was the first child to pass away in the, uh, when they started taking kids away from their parents at the border. And so we remember Jacqueline um, at our lands. We we're growing medicinal plants at Giltrack, which is UC Berkeley. Um, land down in Albany. We are taking care of land there and growing medicinal plants um, there. Um, and we invite people to come and grow food with us and to, to uh, share the land. We have uh, had, a, had the land uh, graded so that Danza could come and uh, do Danza there when they had no place else to, to meet. Um, this is part of our tribe, and so we are not alone. Uh, this is my auntie, who is the elder of our tribe. She's the matriarch of our family. Um, and um, these are some of my grandchildren and some of my cousins and nieces and nephews. And so our tribe um, continues to be sustained in this, in this place, our lands. We've not gone anywhere. Ramai is in West Oakland, and that is another place of uh, land that we take care of. It is a community garden with fruit trees, and we're growing um, vegetables to give out to folks during this time. And this is my youngest grandbaby, who's almost two now. And these are my other grandbabies. Our future generation is here. We have no time to wait. Um, it's time for us to stand together on all of, of all people that live on this land to take care of one another. Um, and so I ask you to support uh, the Segorite Land Trust in doing the work that we do today. And thank you for listening to me. And I look forward to your questions. And I think I have about enough time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, I can put the little... Uh, yep applause icon on my little Zoom. So thank you so much for, for sharing that um, and for getting us started on this conversation. Um, 
I do have um, some questions uh, that we've prepared. Um, and then I'm gonna go in to um, do my best to mediate some of the questions that are coming in for the Q&A. So just to encourage folks, please do. Uh, if you can ask um, your questions within this Q&A, uh, we'll do our best to uh, filter those so that Karina can respond. Um, but yeah, the first question I have for you, Karina, is um, to um, just to, to think about Segorite Land Trust and the work that you're doing, um, that you all are doing, um, just in this moment, you know, how, just how like heavy, weighty, important, we're just, we're, you know, we're, we've been born into a very important historical moment together, you know, and mm. um, I feel like uh, I, I, the, not only this this escalation of climate chaos that we're uh, we're, we're confronting, but also uh, this moment of of uprising and rebellion and solidarity and people really showing up for each other um, mm -hmm. in these times, uh, especially this summer was very very uh, important for us uh, in in this occupied territory of Turtle Island, so called United States. Um, people really showing up, and of course globally. Um, so my question is just, uh, if you could just elaborate um, on how you see um, Segorite Land Trust in that landscape, you know, like work, you're working with, you work with so many different folks I've witnessed, you bring so many people together. So I would just love if you could share a little bit about how, how do you see Segorite Land Trust um, in that world, you know, in the moment we're in? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Marcelo. Um, actually, this, um, when COVID hit, our, we got gathered all of our, all of the folks that work with us, our crew together, and we um, made sure everybody was safe and made sure their families had enough. And then we asked people to sit down for a while, um, just because we didn't know, which like the rest of the world, we were just not sure what to do. About a month after, or maybe three or three weeks or so afterwards, because um, Giltrack got closed down too, because it was a part of UC Berkeley, everything got closed down. But the folks that run Giltrack were uh, actually able to, um, to work with UC Berkeley to ask them if we could keep it open, not for the public, but to harvest the food that was growing there already. And so we, so my partner and I decided to go over and start harvesting food because our staff needed it. Our elders needed it. We were there was uh, we were working with people that were um, immunocompromised. Um, and there was folks that had small children and couldn't get out. So we began to get this food and harvest it and take it out. About a month after we started that, their um, um, Giltrack Farm started receiving boxes, supplemental food that was coming in from other places because the restaurants were all closed down. There was all of this excess food. And so we began, and so actually we called our, our staff back. And so we began to um, deliver a hundred boxes of food a week uh, to elders and community members um, that needed food, fresh food, fruits and vegetables. And you know, most of our communities are are poor or can't get to, can't afford to get to uh, stores and stuff. And it was dangerous uh, for a while there. And so we have a, a wonderful crew of people that have been able to do that. Um, we got another uh, donation of boxes of food. And then recently, and recently we started working with Cultural Conservancy, and they have food production in the um, in the North Bay, and was able to supplement the food that we were getting. For the last three weeks, though, they are the only people that have been giving us food. And so, um, you know, the food distribution, we're trying to figure out how to, how to continue to do that, you know, to make sure that families, um, single moms with children, all of that, uh, those folks are taken care of during this time. You know, it's our responsibility. It wasn't something that had been planned, but it was something that the ancestors asked us to do, and we took it up. And I think that it's a beautiful thing because our staff also started planting food that we can uh, in the small gardens in the different areas that we take care of in order to supplement the food that we have there. We're beginning to think about what is the next step. And so really getting uh, together the Hemeka that's there, having fresh water available. Um, we sent a 
there's a community in Watsonville that had a, a garden, a community garden down there, a bigger garden, pretty big garden, but they had no access to fresh water. So we had one of the, we asked them to come and pick up one of the tanks that holds 1500 gallons of fresh water so they can take it down to their community. We want to make sure that the communities that we ha are working with and have relationships with are taken care of because we know that those are the communities that are most at risk of being left behind. And so we're really growing our medicinal plants right now. We're learning how to dry them and make medicine out of them. We're beginning to uh, learn how to can food and, um, and to dehydrate. And so we're really taking this technology that our ancestors had all of these thousands of years and relearning it and putting it back into use because that's really what's going to help us to survive. Absolutely. Yeah, you're reminding me that um, something I saw, I've seen since the, the pandemic and, and what is happening that um, I saw an article go out about the Chinampa system in, in outside of Mexico City, Mexico Tenochtitlan, the traditional floating gardens are actually mm -hmm. being used and sustaining people at are one of the main sources of food through this pandemic. So, I mean, the food system work that y'all are doing is is so fundamental, of course, for us to be able to to live together and live well and be healthy. So, um, and absolutely, there's these uh, ancestral practices around food, how to grow it and cultivate it. Um, if I could share one more reflection, just listening to you, seeing a satellite image uh, yesterday that was like, you know, a um, hypothetical satellite image of what California would look like if there was no dams that were stealing the water and, re and reverting that for uh, industrial agriculture. So, you know, all of these things um, are coming up in this now we're seeing the effects of that and folks are looking at the sky and not being able to go outside and breathe the air and and being um brought back to these kinds of questions um so um my question um another question i have for um uh specifically around Sagorte um is if you could just take a moment to share with us uh we've um we've, we've talked about the Shumi land tax uh, which we encourage folks to check out on the website. Um, and but I just want to ask in general, you know, is uh, what do you all need, and what can we do uh, as if, if if folks here who are living in Huchin, uh, as guests uh, or others who are signing in from other places, you know, what what do you need, and how can we help support that? Yeah, thank you. That's amazing. I think what we're trying to do right now is to expand Hemecas in different places in different communities. You know, I think we're looking at uh, ways for us to get solar panels that are off the grid to people that, that and communities that need it. You know, there's a lot of our elders that are on oxygen and different kinds of things that need to have uh, some kind of machinery that's going all the time. It would be good to have a solar, a, one single solar panel for them that they could they could charge up and make sure that they have their their oxygen that's going all the time if they don't have a generator. If we're looking at uh, providing uh, tanks for places that, that there's fresh water in different places, not all in one place, but in different neighborhoods across. So there's, we're looking at those kind of things. But, you know, I think we're looking at also for ways that people are growing food and how do you share that? You know, I think that, you know, if we look at what happened during the pandemic, when I started looking for seeds online, many places were without seeds anymore. You know, people began to think about it, not just indigenous people, but people across the country began to thinking about, oh, we could take these little seeds and put them in the ground and we could have food and started thinking about that. But you know, you, you usually get like, you know, a hundred seeds in a pack and nobody needs a hundred seeds. And so how do you begin to share that out and share the wealth of what's growing in your backyard and talking to your neighbors again about let I'll grow this and you grow that and we can exchange it. You know, there needs to start having conversations in the world with each other and stop being scared of each other, you know. I think it's going to take all of us to do that, you know. Um, get Start opening up your front yard and building boxes so that you can grow food that you can share with everybody. So there has to be this idea of not scarcity, but abundance. Mm 
right? My ancestors came from a place of abundance here in the Bay Area. We had songs that were about thank you for so much that we have so much here. There are other tribes that have other kinds of songs about asking to, for, to please for help. But, you know, in the Bay Area, the beauty is, is that there was so much here and there still can be. There is an abundance here of people with generous hearts and good minds. And, and I think that, you know, I think we have to remember that as the generosity, not the scarcity. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to try and take uh, my first question here from folks. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, the Q&A, using the Q&A box to ask these questions. Um, the first question I want to share for you, Karina, uh, comes from a PhD student here at UC Berkeley. Uh, and their question is really asking about the notion of belonging to the land rather than the European concept of ownership of land right, through private property and um, indigenous populations as being in relation of human and non-human. And this, uh, so the question here is, um, how does the land trust uh, engage, you know, this concept, this relationship with, um, you know, uh, the concept of property and ownership, you know, um, how, does, how does the land trust navigate that? Mm. Yeah, so the land trust, um, it, I think I'm going to answer this in a couple of different ways, right? <laughs> the land trust is, uh, has to navigate through the, the operations of the United States government's laws and when it comes to land, right? But a land trust also gives us the opportunity to, to um, uh, smudge those lines a little bit, right? And so um, it allows us to open up land to uh, breathe again to imagine it in some kind of way. Imagine it so that it's not developed, not every single inch of land is, has cement on it and that it could breathe, right? Because the earth is alive. The water is alive, the earth is alive. And I think that that's where we come short as human beings. In a very short amount of time, human beings forgot that they are part of the circle of creation. We weren't created outside of that circle. We were all created. One of the, the fun things and one of the great stories is that we're we were told and we were the last ones that were created everything else was created on this earth for human beings right and so everything has a place here before us so we're the younger brothers and sisters that came along right and if you look at the sky you can see we're pretty bratty because we're messing stuff up but if we remember that we're supposed to be in that circle of relationships that we are no better than anything else that was created and we remind ourselves of where our place is that we weren't on top that we were created after everything else and if we remember this really uh interesting thing that i was taught is that if you look around the world everything that was created before us nothing that was created before us needs human beings in order to be here but human beings needs everything that was created in order for us to be here it kind of humbles us as human beings about where our place in the creation is. Our responsibility, when you have a responsibility to a mountain and a responsibility to a, a river, a responsibility that you have to take those responsibilities and you have to do what you're supposed to do in order to create balance. When other people come to your land and they don't bother to know where the sacred places are and what that responsibility is, what's the receptor? reciprocity because if you take care of the land that it'll take care of you and we've forgotten that because we are too busy trying to build all of these other things that we don't need you know i think we would have a, a better life if we we could concentrate more on um on how to take care of everything you know in the short amount of time during pandemic we saw the earth already starting to regenerate herself and to get to be able to breathe when the smog went away um, and you could actually see the see the stars again when it was quieter um, when animals began to come back into the cities coyotes running around San Fran, downtown San Francisco the places they had been for thousands of years before the city was there and you get to begin to see the water starting to clear that these are all reminders that if we just sat down for a short amount of time, that the earth can begin to fix herself from the harms that, that we as human beings have done. And so I think that um, 
that's what I talk about as, as indigenous people having relationship to the land because we remember what our place is and what our responsibilities to those places are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, um, Karina. Um, so, um, checking out some of the other questions here. Uh, there's a very, uh, I, I appreciate this, this specific question um, coming from Julia uh, Frankenbach is asking specifically, you know, um, is there a way that students, um, there's a lot of students signed in right now from UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and other places and, uh, and or uh, low income community members um, can really show up for Segura Tay Land Trust right now. Yeah, most definitely. I think, you know, one of the wonderful things about Segorte Land Trust and is that we have had uh, hundreds of students come to the land and help us to take care of it, cleaning it and growing food with us and sharing food with us and digging holes with us and putting up all, you know, I, I mean, I think that that's a wonderful way to get a group of students to come over and to learn about the land and to uh, share food and to share work. Um, and to put your hands into the ground, right? Um, that's an absolutely wonderful way of doing that. And we're going to have to wait until, you know, we're through with this pandemic because we want to keep everyone safe. And so we're not taking volunteers right now. But the amazing thing is, is that, um, you know, students can to do uh, amazing, uh, since you're in school already and have access to, to libraries and other things online that you can do some research for us. We're always looking for uh, projects around the culverted creeks. We had like 50 creeks in the Bay Area and they're all culverted. Where are they? Um, we're looking for people to do research like that. You know, we're looking for people to um, actually, um, we have a uh, Seeding Hope, uh, which is in um, We've been, we were doing talks online. We're at looking for someone that will um, transcribe those for us right now. And so, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities to plug into the work, you know, and to come to grow seeds yourselves, to, um, to, to try to do that, to try to do that kind of work, to share it out. Um, uh, and so when, hopefully it comes springtime we'll all be well and we'll um, invite the community to come out um, but there's always things on the website about ways that you can plug in i, I believe and um, to look at our uh, not only at our website but also to uh, email us and um, there's a volunteer email that people can if they're interested they can get on that list awesome yeah uh, i could maybe actually ask for uh, maybe Sophia or Lara, somebody who's helping us on the BCNM side, you can just drop the Segura Tay Land Trust um, website into the chat so that we can find that. Um, uh, another question coming here is specifically to the Land Trust question is, do you uh, have relationship or partnership with other land trusts? Um, and how, do you have a vision for how other land trusts could support uh, Segura Tay Land Trust's mission and vision. So is there a relationship with other people who have taken this land trust model? Yeah, so there's, um, I think that it's really interesting that the Oakland, there's the Oakland uh, Land Trust and they're working with uh, folks to buy their own apartments. I think that that's a great concept, looking at folks being gentrified out of their own homes. And it's a great idea of how to do that. We're looking at land trusts that are um, interested um, in, um, uh, lots of different models about how to work together with uh, with the Segura Tay Land Trust. We're specifically working with a lot of people from across the country right now that are interested in the Shaumi tax and how to create that uh, platform uh, for tribal groups and communities that are doing the work in their um, in their own territories. That's been a wonderful way of doing that. And of course, working with other indigenous. Um, you know, there's only a handful of indigenous land trust in the country. Um, most of them are run by um, um, mostly white male people that run land trusts. And so, you know, it was important for us to do a women-led land trust, an indigenous women-led land trust, because of the difference in our uh, philosophies on what we think land is supposed to be. 
uh, take, how it's supposed to be taken care of. Women have songs for the waters and for the medicines and for the land. Our, our babies' um, umbilical cords are buried in the land. And so there's a different philosophy about how women uh, treat the land and have a relationship with the land than men. Uh, the work with the land trust in the Bay Area, we're working really close with um, the Sustainable Economy Law Center in the Bay Area um, around land trust that they're helping to create. Um, we're trying to have conversations with, uh, we did a, a hundred year visioning in the Bay Area with other people that are joined land trust. Um, they were working closely with um, Decolonize uh, Academy, Poor Magazine, and homeless, uh, Homefulness, um, and the uh, creative way that they're taking land back and uh, creating a land trust in order for them to um, house formerly homeless um, uh, folks in the community um, and building um, without having, uh, without developers. So I think that people are beginning to look at different ways and models that they can do it. And of course, working with folks that are doing community farming and looking at what that looks like to take that into a model of of land trust. And so there's a lot of different models about how to do that. And so we're in conversation all the time with people's um, beautiful and brilliant ideas. Awesome. Yeah. The, um, I think um, a lot of the questions that are coming in are about this, you know, these uh, navigating these relationships. And um, if I could maybe just, um, I think you've been talking about it the whole time, but if I could just uh, bring in a couple of the other questions that are coming from folks um, around, you know, this issue of uh, of land back, you know, the, 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 that 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 is at the heart of the work, and but of course the complexities, you know, the the problems, the the obstacles, what you know, the realities uh, that you all are are working through through the land trust. Um, but I'm also seeing a question you know, based on what was posted even today um, on the Instagram for Segorite Land Trust, um, asking about uh, that there was a quote uh, that it is about physically giving land back, but there's also questions of autonomy, care, decision-making, right? And this idea of, of spirituality in, in this sense, uh, in relation to um, historical responsibility and relationship, right? So I think, um, but my question then is just, um, you know, if there's some lessons learned or any reflections you have for those of us who are in this, who want to support this, this global really movement that's happening, that's calling itself land back, you know, what, what would you, what would you say um, to us that are wanting to support that, that movement? Give the land back. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I think that, that we're at a time in the, in the world where we could begin to think outside of the box and outside of the um, structures that we've been given, the governmental structures that we've been given. And how do we as human beings begin to restructure our minds to think about a different way of living again? What does it look like to give land back? And I think that people are doing it all over the world, like you said. We have people, ranchers that are in Australia giving Aboriginal people back their land. We have people that are on the East Coast that are giving uh, another women-led uh, indigenous land trust uh, land back. We have folks that are in the Midwest that are doing that. We have, a, we have farmers that are retiring out and their children don't want to take up farming. And so why not give that land back? And it's the original people's lands who um, were here and that land was stolen. And so I'm not understanding, I guess the, I think the conversation needs to happen is like, what does that look like then? How do we then change? Because now we're gonna have to change our whole idea of capitalism and private land ownership on its head. We're gonna to have to say that those things don't work anymore and those things don't work anymore because we're finding more people. We're finding in the Bay Area, we have more than abundant amount of places for people to live. And yet we have thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people living on the street. And it doesn't matter how much more they build, those people that are living on the streets right now are not going to be moving into any of those places that they are building, right? And so we still have the same conundrum because people are greedy 
And that's what it comes down to. It's this greed, this idea of greed. But if you can bring the indigenous people to the table when we're making, when we're making policies about water, when we're making policies about, uh, about land usage, when we're talking about um, why are we not uh, really criminalizing people that are poisoning the lands and the waters? Why are we allowing them to um, buy carbon offsets and they can pollute as much as they want as long as they over somewhere hundreds of miles away um, buy off somebody's forest as their offsets? Does that even make any sense? Because the people that are still living in that, in that area are still dying of pollution. So we need to stop believing the lies of corporations and begin to think about it. So land back is more than just the physical land. It's about beginning to think about how do we have this relationship with land? You know, in New Zealand right now, they're giving human rights to water and to mountains, right? So they have the same rights as we do as human beings not to be abused. So we need to begin to think about why are we not doing that to our rivers? Why are we damming them up? When we know when the water runs free that all of the, the, all of the plants and animals and human beings thrive more, that we have more. You know, so if we begin to think about that. Let us now begin to think about giving our, our waters and our, our lands rights, the same rights as human beings. We gave corporations the same rights as human beings. And we can't, uh, so why can't we do that to the things that actually sustain us and that we need in order to survive? Right there, I love that. And yes, uh, I, I do wanna just second that, um, uh, and, and raise up that, you know, now is the time, you know, there's a, there's, there's a convergence happening for us to be able to um, make this uh, demand without any, uh, to support it without an, any sort of these conditions around it. And so just how much of that is just us being able to open our hearts to that, that's that not only a possibility, but it is, it's necessary, you know, it's a necessity for us to, to be uh, in good relationship, right? Um, so along those lines, actually, there's a question coming here um, that's specific to uh, the creek that runs alongside um, the site there, the, the Sean Creek um, that, you, that you said uh, is the namesake for, for your people. Um, is, uh, is there anything that is happening that you could share about the, uh, what is happening around revitalization of that creek and what can folks do, uh, what's needed around um, protecting that water? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that question. So there are friends of San Leandro Creek that are actually doing work around that in different parts. And there's actually folks that have received money to make a, um, a walk along the parks and to clean up, uh, clean up the park. So one, there are people, there are organizations that are doing creek cleanup. And I um, I ask, I beg people to please go and do that because we cannot do everything. And so that is a way of being engaged in the work in the Bay Area and those creeks and waterbeds need our help, right? Um, they need to run free and they need to get all these invasive species out and we need plants. We as Ohlone people need some of our original plants planted near them so that we can survive and do the medicine work that we need to do as well. But um, not only that, but we need to stop culverting and putting the, our water underneath the ground. We need to, it needs to be alive and have sunshine just like us. Our kids need to be able to play in it. We need to figure out, out ways to clean it up the messes that we have here. And wouldn't it be beautiful? Not that long ago, rainbow trout began to come up one of those creeks again. You know, if we could have salmon and rainbow trout coming back up again, what a miracle that would be. And I, you know, we keep talking about, we have to go backwards and actually we don't have to go backwards that long if we could take our footprint back a hundred years even that we would be in such a better place right now here in the bay area and so yes if you, anybody wants to do work with the with the creeks there's a um, friends of Salsal Creek, there's Friends of San Leandro Creek, there's the um, I think there's another uh, five creeks um, friends of five creeks and they're and they're all doing really good work and uh, and so I, I ask people to please go and help do that work as well. Okay. I think that'll have to be um, our last question from the audience. So thank you all for the questions. Um, apologies if uh, we weren't able to get directly to your question. 
Um, but thank you for, for joining us to everyone. Um, there are some questions I saw that we didn't answer directly, but that we're asking. I would like to help transcribe interviews. I'd like to do this, some of these things. So uh, if you look back in the chat, um, there, we are dropping in the Segorite Land Trust website. And I also saw that um, Deja put in info at rematriatetheland.org is a central email you all can email. Um, so to please just, um, that those are the most concrete ways I believe that you can actually connect and offer direct uh, skills and services to support um, our Ohlone relatives. Um, but yeah, with, with that, I just want to just uh, close and give thanks um, and, and just actually uh, ask uh, Karina and just give you that last word of, of gratitude. Um, and just for our last minute, uh, there's any last things that you wanted uh, us to make sure that we had in this space, but more than anything from ECNM from Indigenous Technologies, from me as a, a guest here in Huchin, as a dancente with my calculi with Papalo, that we've been able to dance here on the sacred land. Uh, we're just really grateful um, for you and, and thank you for taking this time. Uh, but I'll just uh, hand, hand it back to you for any last uh, words you may have. Thanks. I just want to thank you, Marcelo and this and Gail and all the staff there that um, actually brought me in to have the conversation. And I want to thank everybody that's out there that's listening, that wants to engage, that are looking to find some place to, to be and to do the work that we need to do as human beings. I'm just uh, grateful to be born into this time that we can work together, that we can struggle together and that we can thrive together. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward to working with you all real soon. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody uh, for, for coming here, um, signing in to the, the, the Zoom webinar, folks walking, watching uh, YouTube, other places. Thank you so much um, for supporting this. Uh, this important conversation. We hope everybody is safe. You know, we hope everybody's protected in these times. Um, and I think with that, we can say hasta luego, chaltunay, peu callar, until next time. <laughs>